So welcome everybody. Um, just before we get going, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the session is being recorded and a recording will be sent to all registrants, whether you were here today or not. So thank you for, for stopping in, whether you're live or, or recorded. My name is Bruce Houghton of HypeBot.com and I'll be your host today, which really is just a little bit of intro and outro because we wanna give you as much time with two true industry professionals as we can, despite what the screen says, uh, one of these guys is Bobby Borg, and the other, the guy with the hat, the good-looking one, there he is, uh, and then Michael Eames uh, as well. They'll be answering questions uh, following the session uh, within the Bands and Town Artist Community, uh, Ask Me Anything space, and there'll be link, the link will be posted in the chat, and that community is free to join. If you haven't joined yet, uh, you really should, A, to be part of the Ask Me Anything, B, because uh, there's also a, a really cool giveaway available uh, involving a book that these guys did. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff happening at the community. So last time, uh, Bobby and Michael, a few weeks ago, did a, a, webinar, a webinar on music publishing royalties. And now they're back to cover the master side. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby and Michael. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to our seminar titled Money from Masters and How to Collect for Independent Artists. So my name is Bobby Borg. I'm Michael Ames. And uh, we're looking forward to sharing a couple, uh, a couple moments with you. We have a, a brief 30 minutes, but we have lots to cover. So we'll get right to it. Um, so the first thing is I'll go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Um, I, I want to say hello to, to everybody. Uh, there's a lot of comments coming in already in the chat. So uh, to one in particular, fight on back to you. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and share our screen with uh, real quick. Um, so let's do this. Okay. Um, so our presentation today is called Money for Masters and How to Collect for Independent Artists um, by Bobby Borg, myself, and Michael Ames. And all of this material is based on a, on a new book of ours called Introduction to Music Publishing for Musicians. So let's get right to it. So um, the first thing that we want to we want to remind you guys, which is a, a really a, a bit of confusion, if you can imagine, because this is a simple concept, really. But there are two different copyrights um, that independent artists are typically dealing with these days. And what I mean by independent artists is the artist that sits in their bedroom, um, writes songs, and then records their own songs. So first, there is the copyright in the song itself, okay? So if you write a song, then you are uh, a 100% owner of that song. And then Michael? Yeah, and then when you go to record that song, uh, you know, for for most independent artists, you know, you're doing it yourselves. Maybe you're producing it yourself as well. You know, the master is a separate copyright from the publishing because your master is now, you know, embodies the composition that you just recorded. So, you know, unless you've involved a producer and worked out a separate deal with them, you're gonna own 100% of your master recording, both as the artist and the master owner, which is a distinction we'll get into in a second. So the recording of a song is two copyrights, okay? All right, let's move on now. Just as a quick review, um, for those of you guys that weren't here last week, on the song side, there are generally four food groups of music publishing um, that, uh, that we, we, we talked about. Um, so the first one is um, mechanical royalties. Um, so that's a very, very important, obviously. And, and when specifically speaking about streaming, which is what most people are interested these days in anyway, you have to make sure that you're registered with the mechanical licensing collective in order to be able to collect your mechanical royalties. So if you don't know what the mechanical licensing collective is, be sure to um, Google it after this presentation and then consider um, signing up. And Michael? And then the next uh, second of the two of four food groups is performance. Obviously, you're going to kind of know what that is, which is all the different types of performance from live performance, radio, television, theaters outside the United States, that kind of thing. And uh, Bobby, over to Sync. 
Yeah, and then of course the way you would collect that is by being a member or affiliate yeah, of a PRO, a performing yeah. rights organization. And there's three main ones. Michael, you want to keep on going real quick? Here in the U.S., yeah, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are the three main U.S. societies. Though there's six in total, but they the three of them have the majority of the members. Okay, and then the next one is sync. Um, sync is when you merge music with a visual image, such as music and TV, music and film, media, um, you know, music and video games. Um, and essentially, the way you would collect that, typically as an independent artist, is if you're representing yourself and you're and someone asks you maybe or you find or uncover a sync opportunity and let's just say a TV show or or something of that nature, um, the the deal would be done directly. Uh, between you, but in many cases there are you know uh, exploitation companies out there, you know people that help you uh, place your music and film, television, and video games. So in that particular case, you know they would be helping you uh, with the negotiations and, and collections and so on and so forth. Uh, print's pretty self-explanatory. You know it's printed sheet music. There is both physical sheet music, digital sheet music and a lot of lyric reprints these days, which you would either license yourself or through a third party rep, you can go through like a Hal Leonard or an Alfred music that aggregates, you know, print rights. Uh, there's music notes that sells uh, digital print rights and then other companies that deal with the lyric reprint. But that uh, that goes down a rabbit hole that we're not there for today. We're going to focus on masters. But before we do that, Bobby, hit the foreign the publishing. Yeah, so foreign sub-publishing is just when these four food groups mentioned above are used in, in foreign territories. And uh, keeping things straightforward and simple, you t technically need some sort of sub-publisher in those territories to represent you to collect that money just by virtue of how the laws work over there. Um, but for independent artists, since a sub-publisher might not uh, be something that uh, could be available to you at this point in your career when you're just starting out, um, Song Trust is a company that you can sign up with that can help you handle that money. So if something is streaming in a foreign uh, territory, there could be money on the table. Um, so you want to make sure that you are, um, you know, part of Song Trust. So if you're not part of MLC, you're not part of a PRO, you're not part of Song Trust, um, you don't have some sort of uh, understanding of, of, of sync, uh, then basically you guys have a lot of homework to do. All right. <laughs> So let's go ahead and move on. So now we're finally getting to our seminar uh, today, which is basically the money you earn from masters. Now this really, there's a lot of confusion in this area and particularly it, it's, it's oftentimes the way it, it's talked about and it's, and it's reported because typically when people talk about like, you know, um, the money, especially that you get from streaming, they don't tend to separate, you know, this is the money you get as the master owner and artist, and this is the money you tend to get, you know, as the songwriter, and they kind of just lump it all together. And when they talk about it, it's all kind of talked about all together. But it's really important that you guys understand that there's two separate and distinct things. So the first thing, obviously, is when you are obviously, um, again, a DIY bedroom indie artist, you know, you record, uh, and write and then record a song. Now we're talking about the recording part of the song, your, actually, your actual performance on the master and, and you actually creating that master recording. So let's just call you the artist, okay? So when, let's just say, for example, um, you know, something streams, right? Because that's the most common way that you guys are distributing your music these days. That money is going to be collected from your distributor, okay? Now, Whoever that is, your distributor is going to collect that and, and, and pay that out to you. Now, just to be clear, when they're paying that part to you, there's still that other songwriter part that you need to get from the MLC. Okay, so if you're just like collecting money from your distributor and you don't know about the MLC, that money is just sitting on the table. So you need to take care of that. Okay. Um, now, let's just say, for example, um, uh, you uh, you don't have a distributor. And let's just say, for example, you, re you make vinyl recordings. And let's just say, for example, you walk into Amoeba and Amoeba agrees, Amoeba Records is, a, is an independent record shop here in California. Um, you walk into Amoeba and they do a consignment agreement with you where they agree to take four of your records and put it in the indie shelf section of the store. 
And then you come in a month later and they say, oh, you know, three of the records sold. So we're going to pay you, you know, whatever deal that you guys make. And they're going to pay you directly because now, in essence, you are the distributor. OK, or if you sell records at your live show and somebody comes up and buys a vinyl recording, um, they are going to hand you ten dollars cash and you're going to take that ten dollars. And then, of course, uh, you're going to factor in, you know, the expenses it costs to record and to actually make or print up that vinyl and whatever is left over. It's, it's all yours. Right. You're not splitting it with some distributor because you are acting as the distributor. OK. All right. So then. Um, it, that's, it's pretty cut and uh, pretty cut and dry, you guys. Uh, but but it's so important that you understand that that there is a difference between the artist and the songwriter here. Okay. All right, um, Michael. Yeah. So you know, moving to our next section of the income that you can earn from your master recording is non-interactive streaming. I want to just touch upon real quick to make sure that everyone understands the difference between interactive streaming and non-interactive streaming. Non-interactive streaming is when you essentially have a radio-like experience that you're tuning in. You can't control what song plays next. Someone else has programmed that for you. And the, the two main sources of non-interactive streaming are Sirius XM and Pandora. But there's also different kinds of internet radio or digital radio. Interactive streaming is when you can manipulate the playlist and the order and that kind of thing. So the, it, I just want to make it clear because there is a lot of confusion between these two types of streaming and the income comes from different sources. Your distributor will always be your source of income as an artist and as a master owner for interactive streaming. But now when you get to non-interactive streaming, so Sirius XM and Pandora, you have to sign up for Sound Exchange, which you can sign up at soundexchange.com. And the, the way to think of Sound Exchange is that it is the PRO for your masters. You know, we talked last month during the publishing about how on the performance side, you've got a writer share and a publisher share. Well, at Sound Exchange, you have a master owner share, which is equivalent to the publisher share of performance. Then you have an artist share of Sound Exchange money, which is equivalent to your writer's share of performance on the publishing side. And you should also be aware for many of you who may maybe just musicians who play on others' records and you're not necessarily the featured artist, that the artist uh, side of Sound Exchange that 50% side is split up where 45% goes to the featured artist and the remaining 5% goes to every musician who played on the record. So it's really important for any of you studio musicians who are playing on other people's records that you know are getting airplay on Sirius XM and Pandora that you sign up at Sound Exchange, which is free to join, and you have to submit an Excel document that spells out what recordings you're involved with, both as master owner on the one side and artist on the other side, whether that be featured artist, you know, or a side musician, or frankly, both. So there's been a lot of money over the years that has just sat at Sound Exchange while they look for people. You can actually even go to their site and uh, consult their database to see if your band or your name is in the, the what they call their pending and unmatched money. So just keep keep uh, you know aware that Sound Exchange, if you're getting airplay in Sirius XM and Pandora, is is actually a significant source of income. Hey, Michael, you might also want to comment on the fact that um, uh, artists are still a little uh, unclear about their the performance side. So in other words, when when they don't um, when they actually don't own the master recording and when they don't own the songwriting, but they just come in as a bass player and play on the track. Um, I, I've been recently asked the question of, um, well, am I still entitled to sounds exchange money? even though I have signed a work for hire agreement, uh, you know, just, just in case. So that it was very, very clear from the person hiring me that I had no ownership in the master and the song, and they just paid me a flat fee. So can you uh, address that really quickly too? Would they still be entitled um, to that, that 5% cut? Hey, well, as long as in that work for hire agreement that you signed, you did not give away your right and ability to collect that sound exchange money, then absolutely, you're totally entitled to it. Right. Perfect. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Let's go ahead and move on um, to synchronization. 
also known as sync. Um, and you know, so if you guys uh, obviously have been paying attention and if you guys know your stuff, which I'm sure you do, you know that on the songwriter side, obviously there's money you get um, in, in synchronization when someone licenses your music and film, television, video games, et cetera. And guess what? The cool thing about it is you also get it on the master side as well. And being that you both own the song and the master, in many cases, people will talk about the, the fees that you get as what's called the, the, the sort of the all in fee, right? So you are sort of now known as sort of a one stop shop. You know, they, people can come to you to license your music and also the master, which actually is quite attractive to somebody that's looking for music and film and television because it makes the whole process so easy. They can just come to you and they can get all the rights. Typically, the way those rights are paid out are what's, what's called on a, on a favored nations basis. So typically, if whatever is paid to the songwriter side is paid to the master side, or if they approach the master owner first, whatever is paid to the master owner is paid also to the um, songwriter. So if somebody says, we'll give you $1,000 all in for this, um, you know, this a piece in a television show, that basically means that 500 is going to the songwriter and 500 is going to the master. And if you're, if you're both the same person, uh, then hooray, right? Even a bigger party and celebration. Um, Okay, so basically, how do you collect it? As I pointed out before, it's, and just now, pretty much it's you. You actually doing this negotiation process yourself one-on-one -on -one with the party that's actually intending to license from you. Or you might have some sort of third-party representative, some you know, person that you've done an exploitation deal with, somebody that agreed to actually pitch your songs and, and seek out placements for you. And then, and then that person would be... Um, doing the negotiation process and things of, of, of that nature. And, uh, and that could even be um, services that are provided from your distributor. Like let's just say, for example, CD Baby, who has CD Baby Pro. One of the things that they do do is uh, synchronization for you as well. So if you're just starting out in the industry and you don't really have a lot of placement opportunities or you don't really know even how this whole system works, um, that could be an alternative for you. So... All right, Michael. Yes. All right, moving over into sort of, I'm going to just refer to this for the moment as the wild, wild west. We kind of lumped sort of, you know, a number of things into sort of this last category uh, of money that you can earn from your masters. Uh, I'm going to take YouTube first. Um, you know, usually your distributor that you sign up to, uh, your digital distributor is going to service your music to YouTube. Uh, generally, because a lot of times they'll you'll see what are called art tracks up on YouTube, where it's essentially just your album cover and then, you know, your music playing. Uh, but they may also you you depending on your distributor and and what functionality they have, what services they offer, there might be other ways on YouTube. But you know, let's face it, we've all been to YouTube, we've all dealt with all the ads. And as much as the ads are, are annoying, you should be aware that we as master owners, uh, artists, as well as songwriters and publishers are participating in that ad revenue. That's how we're all getting paid. And that was the deal struck with Google and YouTube years ago because they knew that they were infringing on all of these musical compositions and master recordings because users are uploading their own videos, their own content, etc. So you need to and may, most distributors who will service to YouTube will also offer, you know, a way to collect your ad revenue, uh, your share of that. And YouTube has a very specific system on how everything gets handled, how it's paid, etc. It gets, it. We could do an hour just on the YouTube, what they call content ID and CMS, their content management system, but. You, you know, as much as at one level, we have a love hate relationship with Google and YouTube because at one level we hate them honestly in the music business because they pay the lowest rate of anyone. But on the flip side, YouTube, like it or not, has almost, you know, is considered one of the biggest streaming services around because there's so many eyeballs and ears on YouTube. So we kind of had to sort of do the deal with the devil, so to speak. And, but you need to make sure that your ad revenue money is getting collected and monitored and taken care of. 
And if it's not through your distributor, you can sign up for a separate service that will do that for you. There, Because ironically, there is a company called AdRev. Uh, they, they were one of the first ones. They're owned by the CD Baby parent company. Uh, but there's there's a whole number of other you know sort of services that will do this. Um, so just be aware of that and make sure you're clear with your distributor. What do you do and what you don't do? Which me, makes me move over now to TikTok and Twitch. You know, two very popular platforms right now. That's what the TT slash T is in our summary here that we put on one one page. Um, you know, some distributors distributors service their music to TikTok and Twitch, and some do not. Um, TikTok is finally licensed with the music business overall, but Twitch is still not licensed. Uh, Roblox is another one that is in the midst of going through uh, how they're going to sort of get licensed. So, you know, when you're picking your distributor, if you want to be on these platforms, you need to make sure that your platform has a deal with these TikTok, Twitch, Roblox, etc. Because if they don't, your music won't get up there. And if you were to somehow upload it yourself without a distributor, you're not going to get paid anything because you don't have a deal with those platforms directly yourself. And a lot of artists have problems with music gets, you know, turned off and muted, particularly on Twitch. And this, this is the wild, wild west aspect of what's going on right now, because everyone in the business is just trying to figure out how do we make these platforms work for us from a monetization area. We all know it's great for promotion and that can spill over into all the other areas that we've talked about above. But just be very careful when you're you ask questions of your distributor because not every distributor services to all of these platforms right now. But it's a very important area that's growing on a daily basis that you should be informed about. Bobby. Yeah. So when uh, so so some of those distributors that do do um, administration again, we have CDBP and TC and other services in there. Do you want to talk about those just real quick? Yeah, so, you know, CDBP was our short way for, you know, CD Baby Pro and TC is TuneCore. Um, you know, they both have publishing administration services. And, you know, like for I know CD Baby Pro, which is powered by Song Trust, they, they don't collect, you know, income relating to masters. But again, I mentioned AdRev before that is all part of that sort of family. Uh, TuneCore, I, you know, I collects on YouTube and, and some of these areas, but I honestly can't definitively tell you whether TuneCore is, you know, specifically wired into every single one of the platforms. Um, you know, DistroKid is uh, an, another popular, you know, sort of platform. And, uh, you know, I see, we'll get to Ben's question here, maybe towards the end here, I'd see he's asking about DistroKid, but, um, you know, just just be aware you've got services. You know, your your distributor may not be your one stop shop, depending on the distributor. I think is the message we really want you to take from this, and you should just do some research. We're gonna finish up with this really quickly. I'm gonna let Michael talk about the how to collect, and I'm just gonna pose a really quick question for you guys about the type of money. So yeah. um, we're talking about neighboring rights, okay? So first of all, I've got a problem. As a marketer, I've got a problem with this word, <laughs> neighboring rights. What this basically means is, is this means your rights to um, master recordings for terrestrial radio broadcasts, essentially. And uh, the reason why they call it neighboring rights um, is I'm, I'm taking it because when you have a, a record, you have basically the song on the record which is the neighbor I, I think that sucks personally i i here's my uh here's what we should call it we should call it master performances or how about master terrestrial radio performances or how about if we want to be hip mtrps or or, or we could just <laughs> right it sound all futuristic right or just how about mtps you know master terrestrial performances because that's what it basically refers to. And in the United States, for your master recording, um, when it broadcasts on terrestrial radio stations, um, you are not you are not paid for that. And and so you're not paid for for owning that master, playing on the master. You're not you don't get anything. The only person that gets paid is the songwriter. However, in territories outside of the U.S., excluding maybe one or two countries, you are paid. 
Um, and you, you all might be surprised by that. Like, really, wow, we don't get paid in the US, but you do outside in different territories. So I'm going to let Michael um, talk a, a little bit more about the collections on that side of things in foreign territories. And, and I'll just remind Michael that we probably only have about a minute or two yeah. here and then maybe time for maybe one question and then we got to roll, I think. Yeah, right? no, for okay. sure. Yeah, because Bruce will be coming on to wrap things up. Um, so, yeah, the thing that's really interesting is here we are in the United States, the biggest music market in the world, and we have no way for artists and master recording owners to earn any royalties from traditional terrestrial radio. We have the digital radio because we talked about sound exchange, but it's basically the U.S., North Korea, and I Iran that are basically one of the few three countries in the entire world in which a performance royalty does not exist for master recordings on traditional radio. So, you know, there is there are lots of movements in the in the government in the US to get this changed, but just know that outside the United States, this income stream exists as well as other different income streams relating to masters that don't exist in the US. So, we say PPL here in our list, sound exchange is our closest and only version of master performing rights in the US and they have reciprocal rights with all the master societies around the world including PPL which is the UK British version of collecting master rights. So a lot of people in the United States have sound exchange for the US but then join PPL for the rest of the world. So that's why we wanted to mention that sort of in here. But just know that it's a very complicated area of income and just know it's very sizable. Um, and the only other thing that I'll mention briefly is that because we don't have those rights, we get um, we get discriminated against because those societies overseas don't want to pay us for their version of neighboring rights when we don't pay them. So there's a lot of money that we don't get as U.S. artists and uh, master owners. And that wasn't that short, but I tried my best. All right. So really quick to close it up, I just want to remind you guys, first of all, a big thank you. Um, and we also want to remind you guys that a lot of the material was based on a book called Introduction to Music Publishing for Musicians, which was just published in July and is available on Amazon. So we'd love you guys to check that out. And then further, if you guys want more information like this, uh, please be sure to check out uh, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Bobby Borg for tons more stuff just like this. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you guys, uh, Michael and Bobby. That was an awful lot of information, but you covered it really well. And as we said before, they're gonna be in the Bands of Town artist community, uh, ask me anything. So if you sign on to that, which again is free and there's a link that I think we should repost if we can in the chat, uh, you know, they'll be uh, there and available to answer questions over time. Also, uh, two people that RSVP'd within the artist community are randomly going to win digital copies of the book. So thank you, gentlemen. And then there's um, one hard copy as well. So everybody get in there, ask those questions, uh, read the book, check out Bobby's YouTube channel. I also want to thank, thank Jojo Lee and Rachel Rubin who put this together and, and do all the uh, Bands and Tile webinars. Exactly. They really do the heavy lifting to get things going and, and bring uh, people like Bobby and Michael uh, with all the great information they have. So we've got more webinars coming up early next year and throughout the year, and everybody just sort of stay tuned for that. But most of all, Michael and Bobby, thank you. You came twice, you're answering questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anytime. thanks very much. Cheers, uh, we, uh, we love bands in town, this community is awesome. So thank you again for putting it on. Thank you, we love you guys too, take care. Thank you, take care.